Okay, uh, good evening. Open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews 10. Uh, beginning at verse 19. Hebrews 10, starting at verse 19, it says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, uh, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, uh, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another... Uh, to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Uh, well, I guess we can finish off. Uh, for if we sin willfully after that, we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. Uh, for we know him that hath said Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, but call to remembrance the former days in which ye, after ye were illumined, ye endured a great fight of afflictions, partly whilst ye were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst ye became companions of them that were so used. Uh, for ye had compassion of me in my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye you have in heaven a better and enduring substance. And cast not away therefore your confidence, which ye have, or excuse me, which hath great recompense of reward. Uh, for ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, uh, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of uh, them who draw back unto perdition, but of them who believe uh, to the saving of the soul. All right. It's kind of a lengthy passage. We're going to be looking 19 through 25 uh, primarily, uh, but the other fits within the context. Okay. The writer uh, of the book of Hebrews, uh, well, we know ultimately it's God, it's the Holy Spirit. Uh, as he born along holy man. We don't know in particular who the human instrument that was used. It's speculated it could have been Paul, it could have been possibly Apollos, it could have been a number of people. The strong evidence is, suggests that it might have been Paul, but that's, that's not the point of this message. I'm not here to argue that. Um, nonetheless, we know it's God the Holy Spirit that had given this. And he's writing to Jewish believers that are under a uh, severe form of persecution um, beyond just the ostracized that they normally would encounter within their own culture. Uh, once they receive Christ, they, in addition, are being uh, persecuted by the legal government under which they find themselves under, which would be Rome. And so they're getting uh, attacks and pressure uh, from not just, you know, people, their own kinsfolk, according to the flesh, but in addition to just the legal government. And so, uh, in writing to them, 
it's primarily an admonition to them that they turn not back to, um, I guess, the beggarly elements, as is stated earlier in the book. And that is that they would follow uh, Judaism uh, rather than follow Christ, uh, because at least they would alleviate some of the persecution that they would be receiving. So, um, but the thing is, what Christ had done, which is he died and he rose again from the dead three days later, and that he is the fulfillment of the law, which states earlier in the book, is that uh, he's freed them. So there's no need for them, basically, to go back to what they were worshiping under because it's it's fruitless. There's no point to it. Uh, Christ is the fulfillment of that. Uh, and so the writer admonishes to these believers that one, don't quit, don't turn back, and here's why, because Christ is better than, and he starts presenting argument after argument as to what Christ is better than, in particular within Judaism, that he's, he's better than the angels, he's better than Moses, uh, he's better than Joshua, he's better than the high priestly system that they have uh, under Levi, the Levitical priesthood system, because Jesus' priesthood is of a different nature. Um, and then he... Uh, addresses them in particular that they need to grow as well, they need to mature, they need to, uh, they've been lax in their application of what they've been taught. And as a result, they are being, uh, they're stunted in their growth, spiritually. But he tells them, as an undercurrent as well, if we, if we, well, if we read the whole book, we'd see that there's an undercurrent that they need to exercise faith and they need to exercise patience. And that is in particular faith because God gives promises uh, that he's going to fulfill and that what they're resting in, what they're relying on, in other words, what they're trusting in, which is Christ, is better than. And then you need to exercise patience because although right now you find yourself in a position where you are experiencing a great amount of uh, pain and hardship and difficulty, uh, the thing is what God promises and what Christ has promises is far greater and far better than what uh, not just what you can receive here, uh, but also it's, it's not worthy to be compared as, as, as uh, Peter wrote right uh, to the glory that should follow as far as the, the, the hardships that we're enduring right now. So we get to chapter 10, and he is finishing up with regard to the law uh, in verse 1 where it talks about for the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of things can never, uh, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year, continually make the comers there unto perfect. And he is finishing just basically his argument with regard to why Christ is better than the law. And Christ is better than you following uh, the, the, the high priestess system that you guys were under. And he finishes up his argument here before transitioning uh, with regard to faith in chapter 11, but uh, in verse 19, in that he states, um, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Okay, so in other words, um, and then having an high priest over the house of God, we have, because of what Christ did, uh, have absolute total access to be able to go to the holiest of holies, in other words, you could go actually before the presence of God himself, uh, where no man previous would be able to enter outside of just what would have been the high priest, which would have been at that point once a year to come and bring offering before God on behalf of the people. Uh, but they didn't really have direct access to God, uh, just any, any, any old person. Uh, whereas now, because of Christ, we do. So his admonishment is that because we have that and because beyond just the fact that we have a new way that's open and we have the high priest, Jesus himself, uh, let's draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Now, we do so, it says, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So in other words, we come to God in holiness, right? You, you don't come to him with sin. Well, you would come to him with sin if you're seeking forgiveness of sin. You know, um, um, 1 John 1 9, where you know, we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So you need cleansing. 
you go to God for cleansing. Um, but let's let's draw near. Let's draw near with a uh, with a true heart and full assurance of faith. We have been uh, beyond, I guess, any other generation, and I don't mean just even just our living generation, but I guess this time period, which we know as the church age, have been privileged beyond any other to have as close access to God as I guess is, is possible outside of just being in His presence. Uh, in heaven um, so we ought to take advantage of the fact that we have direct access to him now this begs the question how do you do that <laughs> how would we do that I mean I know he the writer tells him let's draw near with a true heart uh, we have access to him but how would we do that like practically speaking how would they have done that? Faith. Yeah, okay, like, okay. How, how else? Like, you know, it's, okay, it, I want to I wanna get close to God. I want to draw, draw near. So, so what do I do? Oh. Pray. Yeah, quote scripture. Well, yeah, we don't have to go through a priest. Okay. How, how, is there anything else? Quote scripture. Back to him. Oh, all right. <laughs> okay. Be a part of the church. He's going to get to that. Okay. He's going to get to that. Okay. All right. All right. Coding scripture is good, but getting, getting into scripture is what I'm getting at. Okay. Yes, pray. Thank you that you did bring that up. Okay. We pray because that is our, I guess in a sense, that is, it's our coming before God with bringing our petition before him, but in other words, when I, to some degree, our worship is modeled. I mean, obviously, it's, it follows a model of what we see in Acts, but what would they have modeled from? What is their frame of reference or whatever they would constitute? What would, they would, have, what would have constituted worship of God to them? Psalm Sacrifices. Tabernacle, <laughs> or the temple. Going to the temple. Sacrifice. Yeah. So, okay. So and then what they would? It's you coming before God. Now we know. Well, it doesn't say it here. It does. It say it says it later in the book that the sacrifices of God are not just a broken and contrite heart, uh, but the fruit of our lips. It's, it's giving thanks. It's, it's praising the Lord. Okay. As far as here now, we don't. You might see this in it. You actually, you, you might see this still in the Catholic Church, okay? But, um, and again, I'm not, I'm not trying to knock churches that say this, but this is this isn't like an altar, okay? We don't let it literally bring up animals and, and kill them here, and then you know tear them to pieces or whatnot, and then spill the blood over, and that kind of stuff, and then wait for God's fire to consume it before our eyes, okay? Um, I think I have an idea as far as like why people do that because okay that's that's what they would have done and then, okay hey you come before but that's what would have been as far as within the Old Testament system uh, under the temple uh, and well obviously going back even before that before the tabernacle where you are there they have corporately gathered to sing praise to God uh, to have the priests on the behalf of the people bring to God the offerings that they would have brought upon the altar to be consumed and to be as a sweet smelling savor showing to God, hey, let I you know, I love you, I believe you. Uh, now obviously they were under some they they had obligation to, to fulfill that and we know that not everybody that would have uh, lived under the um, uh, Levitical system was an actual believer in the Lord Jesus, or would have been, you know, in the, a believer in Messiah that actually had uh, received salvation. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, this is, I guess, what they would have come before. So they would come. They would gather corporately. They would gather basically the organized group where they would sing praise, and then they would offer the offerings. Now later, that would be modified some because after they would go into captivity they would not have, at least the ones that were in captivity, 
uh, ability to be able to go to worship in Jerusalem. Uh, at which time uh, we see some of within Ezra that they would gather and they would have the word of God uh, communicated to them distinctly so that they would come to an understanding, okay, this is what the word of God says. And then the people would cry out, amen, amen, or they would cry uh, because of just the conviction that they were under. Uh, and then you would see some of that still followed um, into what would be the New Testament period where though the temple is still standing, uh, it's been rebuilt, you got Herod's temple at this point in time, and then people would go gather. They would have synagogues in which they would gather uh, distinctly. Now, most of those would have been more of educational uh, institution rather than uh, systematized worship, but they would gather together and then they would read from, and then you would have people that would give discourse from, uh, from what was read, and you have Word of God communicated there. Nonetheless, okay, back to the point. So we draw near, how would we do that? Well, in our day and age, okay, we don't have Jesus as our offering, okay? So, really the only thing, we're not commanded as far as, we are commanded, okay, obviously to bring the fruit of our lips, thanksgiving, so to give an offering and then a broken and contrite heart, give ourself, uh, and I would say, I mean, obviously, and yeah, pray, but get in the Word of God. In other words, you seek out to be exposed to the Word of God, because that's how I am going to hear from God. And at the beginning of the book of Hebrews, he states that uh, God at Sunday triumphs and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, but in these last days hath spoken unto us by his Son, and you know, whom, whom we have appointed heir of all things, and by whom. You know, he made the world, and so um, it's it's getting in the book and taking the time to have a heart that says, "Lord, speak to me, communicate to me, instruct me, uh, enlighten my understanding, that I would know you better." Um, now, a lot of that will come about in different way. You should, I believe, which we'll do this in a Sunday school after following. Uh, following the, the one that we're doing in the King James Bible uh, is just how to study the Bible. Um, and you should, I believe you should have a systematized way because uh, it's helpful. Uh, it's helpful to have just an organized manner in which to go about doing it. And there's, there's many different ways as far as you know doing a word study, or just doing a book study, and, and those kinds of things. But just getting in with the specific intent of you wanting God to instruct you with regard to not only what he wants you to learn but also to know him better because really that's the ultimate goal is we are seeking to know him know him better and the only way I get exposed to that is by what he's given us I can analyze who he is how he is uh, based on his interaction with you know in recorded history of with other humans and I see okay if he's done that before he can do it again We've done that with them, which I'm not much different, though we are, you know, millennia removed, uh, hundreds of years removed, thousands of years removed from the people that lived here, and even different culture, different language, and those kinds of things. But the fact is, they're still human. I'm still human. It's the same God, and He can work just the same in, in me, in my life, supernaturally, as He has with them. So we are to draw nigh because of this privilege that we have. Uh, and then He says, verse 23: Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Now here's why, for he is faithful that promised. Okay, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Okay, so draw near and then hold fast. Now in particular, uh, the profession of our faith, which is, it's that's testimony, right? In other words, Jesus has saved me. It, the profession of our faith is Jesus is the Messiah. Okay, so he, in other words, he's the one that cleanses me from sin, has cleansed me from sin, is keeping me from sin, and ultimately I will be with him in heaven uh, totally removed from the presence of sin altogether. Um, if he doesn't return first, and then at that point, then I'll have my body transformed, and then we'll be risen up together with him to be in the clouds. Um, 
So holding fast a profession of our faith, uh, here's why he's he's faithful. That promise, in other words, um, it's twofold. It's primarily the focus is the fact that he's not going back on his word. Right? He's not just giving you some kind of empty promise and it's a bubble, so to speak, that uh, some kind of, uh, wow. <laughs> you know the, the uh, little soap bubbles, those little toys that the kids go around and they go and blow, right? A lot of times we look at, in reality, that's what the world offers. Okay. That's that's reality. According to God's perspective, that's reality. That that's what the world offers. But we usually tend to think of that as being God's promises a lot of times, or we value uh, God's you know God's commandments, God's words, God's promises of what He has for us as being one of those little soap bubbles. That wow, it looks really pretty and really nice. You go to reach it for it, and then it's like, boom, it pops, and there's, it's empty. But there's no value to it, right? That's, yeah, I know it sounds wicked to say that, but the fact is that's our, usually that's our estimation a lot of times of what God says about what he has for us, what he has coming for us. And a lot of times that's why we end up not really giving our whole hearts to pursuing that or to pursuing what God has. And so the thing is, we should not uh, waver in our profession. In other words, we should, in our testimony, in our pursuit of God, uh, because that communicates a few things. One, that could be, I mean, obviously, <laughs> it's, it's communicating reality that, hey, look, I'm misplacing value on, on what God says, but also, um, we, we've been called to be uh, witnesses, we've been called to be salt, we've been called to be light, and God is using us to draw people to himself, okay? Believers and unbelievers. Uh, by believers, that is, we, which he's going to get ready to talk about here, is to, to provoke one another to love and the good works, and uh, it's to help encourage one another so that we would obviously keep walking and drawing nigh. And then to unbelievers, because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so that that puts an obstacle to God using that. Um, and the fact is, he, he doesn't lie, so we shouldn't misrepresent him in that way by not holding fast. Uh, and then verse 24, uh, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Now, why would this even have to be said? You know? Um, the fact We've been, this is all predicated on the fact that we have a new and living way that's been consecrated for us, right? That we have uh, boldness to enter the holiest. Now, boldness there, mind you, is like the idea of liberty or freedom. It's the difference between, like, say, you walking into your own room or your own house or your own bedroom as opposed to you walking into the Oval Office at the White House. Okay. <laughs> how, how, many, how many have actually been into the Oval Office before, ever taken a tour of the White House? Taking a tour of the White House, but not the Oval Office. Okay. Well, I haven't either. I have taken a, a tour when I was a kid. I was about maybe 11, maybe 12 years old. Uh, but I never got to go, like, in. Uh, okay, how... Say we were transported there, okay, and then tomorrow they're giving tour, and then they have a uh, state of time where within the tour we could actually go in. All right, how many of us would just walk right in and be like, "Hey, what's up, Don?" Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just sit on the uh, one of the couches or whatever, kick your feet up. Like, how many? How many of us would uh, do that? I, I do know some people that might have a little bit of brashness to them that would try to attempt that to be funny, you know. But I, I just be honest, how many, how many of us would attempt that? All right. 
some people try to put mama maybe. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but I mean, the thing is, it's not, yeah, not very many because the thing is, you realize, it's like, hey, this isn't my place. Even a lot of times, what not everybody respects it, but even when we go to strangers' houses that are known friends, we're usually respectful of, you know, this is their property, this isn't mine. Uh, if you've been properly home trained, I should say. But the idea with boldness there, it's, I have absolute liberty. In other words, this is just as mine as it is who the rightful owner is, which is obviously is God's. So the throne room is just as my is just as much mine. Not that obviously it's my throne room, but rather, in other words, I have as much access to it as anybody else. Uh, as much as God does. Because he's opened that for me. So in other words, he's welcoming me in and says, Here's your space. Here's your spot. Now that's I mean, uh Kind of a shame that we a lot of times don't realize that, but more so that we don't take advantage of that because it's it's available for us. Christ did what He did so that we would have that, and so God wants that for us. Uh, that that's why He's opened it for us, and then that, that's why He's calling us out to draw. But um, the consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works is predicated upon that that we have the liberty to be able to go into the holies of holies. And then we have that high priest of God, the Lord Jesus, that's opened the way. So as a result, uh, he says, let's consider one another to provoke and uh, unto love and to good works. So now, uh, provoking one another unto love and good works, uh, how is that accomplished? It kind of actually tells us in verse 25, in part, not exclusively, this isn't the only way, but this is basically the primary way that he's established for us. And that is that he says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Okay? Um, we have a responsibility to... I'm. I'm not trying to bash you guys here. I'm glad you guys are here. This excites me. It's thrilling that you guys are here tonight. Uh, but and I'm not trying to be like, you know, a downer or anything like that or be gloom and doom or anything like that. But the fact is there's a lot of folks that aren't here. And I understand there's work schedules that maybe conflict. Um, and, you know, maybe some people are ill or tired of traveling as, as pastors right now. Uh, but the fact is there's a lot of people that could here, but are not. Um, and that's that's kind of like, wow, man, you know. Um, we ought to take into consideration, okay, um, and this isn't an issue of us looking down our nose, but rather it's, it's what God has called us to. Uh, we have a responsibility to our brothers and sisters in Christ to see that, hey, they're encouraged, they're exhorted, uh, as even Paul would write later that, that we're to exhort one another daily uh, lest we should be uh, hardened by sin. Actually, <laughs> it's, it's uh, chapter 4. Uh, I want to say Paul, but it's not Paul. It, it, it's, uh, it's good to answer chapter 4 is that we're supposed to exhort, encourage one another, exhort one another daily uh, lest we be uh, hardened by sin. You know, we, we'd be deceived by the deceitfulness of sin. And so we um, yes, we are on a race, and we're on an individual race, and not everybody's going to be at the same level, obviously. But the fact is, uh, God wants you to see, or God wants to see you finish your race in a manner that He could say, "Well done," and He wants uh, your life to have uh, eternal value to it. Now, granted, I we're not to judge one, uh, you know compare ourselves amongst ourselves because that's not wise and then I'm not to judge another man's servant. Um, but there are some things that are pretty clear. Obviously, the assembling ourselves together is, is, you know, is one of the things that he's pretty clear on and that is that uh, I am in the gathering, the corporate gathering of believers to worship God, to be able to give our sacrifices as would be uh, 
in the old, but now in the new. Uh, and this day would be sacrifice of praise, of thanksgiving, uh, and to be able to give of, uh, hey, encouraging words, edifying one another, uh, and to be able to uh, provoke or disturb, hey, brother, how's it going? What did you learn from God today? Uh, and these kinds of things. Uh, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Um, it encourages so that we would continue on, that we would keep on, that we would not have a, a, a life that by our slight deviation would end up being fruitless or wasted uh, so that we, one, obviously would stand before God in a well-pleasing manner, uh, but two, uh, that we would be faithful and being the testimony that we should so that we would be used to be able to uh, have folks drawn to the Lord uh, as he's desirous of doing. And so, let's take this into account and be mindful of these things that we are to draw near, uh, we're to hold fast our profession, and then we're to provoke one another to love and to good works because we have a new and living way uh, that's been opened for us and we have boldness therein to be able to enter the holiest of all uh, by the blood of Jesus. So let's not waste um, basically what God has opened for us or God has given to us so that um, when we look back, we don't have you know, regret or even for some maybe we don't have as much regret um, so that we can you know, rejoice. We can hear, well done. And um, hopefully we would be able to see many, many drawn many encouraged, many stirred up, many provoked unto love and good works, many exercising uh, their spiritual gift, and many exercising what have been open to them uh, so that you know, God not only just would be pleased, but uh, he'd be glorified. Right. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this evening. Lord, I pray this now that uh, you not just help me to be mindful, Lord, of these things, but Lord, uh, just be a testimony and exemplify them in a way that, Lord, that you, uh, you uh, people who want to dry out of you, thank you for what you will praise and peace. Amen. All right, let's take a few moments and. Uh